Pelicotherium is one of my favorite fossil mammals, and that's because it's really unlike anything we have today, despite it being pretty closely related to some modern day animals that are very familiar to us. So what exactly was Calicotherium, and why did it have such strange proportions, with its very short rear legs and very long front legs, as well as its large hand claws that it needed to walk on its knuckles to keep off the ground? And how did these different adaptations make it so successful? Calicotherium was around from about 16 million years ago to about 3.5 million years ago, so a pretty good long stretch of time. And related animals were also similarly successful. In fact, some of these animals, like Anisodon, have formerly been considered species of Calicotherium. So why was this specific body plan so successful during the Miocene and into parts of the Pliocene? And why are they not here today? But we really need to think more broadly than just time when we're thinking about the success of Calicotherium. Because fossils have been found first in Germany, but then later more complete fossils in places like Nebraska and the United States, and then slowly filling in gaps in between there, with fossils coming from places like Greece, Turkey, India, and China, as well as some new fossils that have been closer to places like Kenya, meaning that it was pretty much everywhere across the Northern Hemisphere. So this group was very successful, and its adaptations are a major part of that. And you might start thinking about its claws and thinking, well, maybe it was catching prey with those claws, but the teeth really show that that wasn't the case. Because rather than having carnassial teeth, the kind of sharp blades that modern day predators like cats and dogs have, it instead had flat grinding molars, more suited to eating plants. And so rather than having these large claws for hunting and catching prey, it's far more likely that instead it was kind of like a couple of other herbivores that have evolved in the fossil record. Things like Therizinosaurus, which also had large claws, but was using them to essentially pull down branches so that it could eat from those branches. And you can actually see some of this same kind of body plan in some modern day animals. This is especially true when you look at the pelvis of Calicotherium, where there are some tuberosities, which a tuberosity just means there's a more rough texture, which makes the bone more suited to being present on the ground for long periods of time. So essentially it just means it sat on its butt a lot of the time. And when we think about modern animals that might be similar, we can actually start comparing it to the modern day giant panda. Because giant pandas sit around a lot of the day and use their long arms to pull a bamboo closer to them so that they can eat it. And there's a good chance that Calicotherium did a similar thing. However, Calicotherium was also much larger. So it's not that likely that it was eating just smaller things like bamboo, but very well could have been pulling down on branches of different trees. And the claws probably played a big portion in them being able to reach many of these plants because these large claws would be pretty resistant, and so would be able to better hook onto many different types of thorny plants potentially, and help these animals be able to eat a wider variety of different foods. But it's also important to note that these claws would have actually hampered the animal when it walked, so much so that rather than walking on the pads of its feet, it would have needed to walk on its knuckles, somewhat like a gorilla, which you can honestly see as a somewhat comparable animal. It also sits around for large parts of the day and uses its long arms to pull plants to its mouth. So there's a lot of animals that have somewhat similar body plans. It's just that the things that Calicotherium is related to really don't have that similar body plans. And you can actually see that in some of its closest relatives, which are still Calicotheres, but in a different group of the Calicotheres. So you have Calicothera day, which is the family that includes all Calicotheres. But then you have two subfamilies within that. The Calicothera nae, which is animals like Calicotherium and Nisodon, the ones with the long forelimbs and the short rear limbs. Meanwhile, you have another subfamily, the Schizotherinae, which includes animals like Moropus, which have a much more traditional body plan for a mammal where all four limbs are on the ground. However, they also still had large claws, they just evolved an extra joint essentially, an extra musculature to help them lift those claws off the ground while they were walking. So they were still pretty different from most other animals that were around at the time, but they still weren't quite as bizarre as animals like Calicotherium. But this is important because we can actually study their teeth to better understand what these animals were doing. One thing that this group did that was actually pretty different than any of their relatives is they lost their front incisors on the top part of their jaw, not the bottom. What this means is they were likely eating fairly soft plant material, and that essentially just the bottom incisors pushing into a gummy mass at the top of the mouth was enough to crop off and clip off different branches and potentially other foods. But there's more than that because we can actually look at many of the molars and see what kind of wear patterns there are on the teeth. And microwear occurs in every kind of animal. 
essentially you look for teeny tiny scratches on the teeth and you're able to figure out, well, yeah, I was probably biting this kind of plant or this kind of meat or this kind of bug, all just based on the teeny tiny scratches on those teeth. And what the researchers found when looking at both Meropis and Calicotherium's relative Anisodon is that they actually had two different feeding strategies. Looking at the tooth wear patterns in Schizotheridae with animal Meropis, it actually seems like it had teeth wear patterns that were more similar to animals that browse on leaves, which makes sense when you consider its larger body plan, which is honestly not that different from an Okapi, which is a relative of the giraffe and lives in forests. So there might be some convergence going on there. Meanwhile, in animals like Calicotherium and Anisodon, it seems like there were actually two different wear patterns on their teeth, which is indicative of something that's a more broad general grazer, but judging by the other adaptations present in these animals, means they may have also been more selectively feeding on fruit rather than just leaves, and essentially using their long arms to select the branches that had those fruits. However, again, there still are only two of these wear patterns, which means they wouldn't have been having quite as diverse of a diet as many more generalized grazers, like deer and horses. And that brings us to what this animal was related to, because when you think about it, it's herbivorous, evolved in the Cenozoic, and really could be related to either of these two groups, especially when you consider that both of these groups have pretty flat teeth designed for grinding plants. So which one of them was it? Well, deer and horses aren't actually that closely related, and you can actually tell that based specifically on their toes, because deer are artiodactyls and horses are perissodactyls, and that essentially just splits it up into even-toed ungulates and odd-toed ungulates. The even-toed ungulates, as you might guess, have an even number of toes, and the odd-toed ungulates, as you might guess, have an odd number of toes. Very straightforward. Biologists aren't that original with most of their names. They just like to use fancy jargon for it as opposed to just simple terms in a lot of the literature. But what that does mean is that when we look at the number of toes that animals like Calicotherium had, we could figure out which group it belongs in. And when you look at that front hand of it, it has three toes, meaning that it is an odd-toed ungulate, a perissodactyl. However, the horses aren't its closest relatives. Horses actually went to the extreme within this group because they actually only have one toe now. So, you know, they're kind of running around flipping everybody off, but you don't really notice it because they don't have the other fingers to help show that it's in the middle. <laughs> so when we consider that Calicotherium is a perissodactyl, it's essentially related to horses, and some people have even taken to calling it a gorilla horse because it has those very specific proportions, but is also very closely related to horses. And when you consider other animals it could be related to, like tapir and rhinoceros, it's entirely different from any of those animals, despite the fact that it's probably closer to animals like the rhinoceros and tapir than it is to horses. But gorilla tapir doesn't really roll off the tongue in the same way. Even still though, it's not that close to rhinoceros and tapir, and that's largely because it seems like it actually branched off much earlier than the tapir and rhinoceros branched off from one another. And that's kind of wild when you think about it, because rhinoceros, tapir, and horses all generally eat fairly low-hanging plants. There's nothing in those groups that are absolutely massive, at least in the modern day. There are some giant rhinos that are in the fossil record, but nothing quite like Calicotherium even still. So just some strange mutations allowed Calicotherium to start selectively picking fruits off of trees, and that worked out really, really well for them at least during large parts of the Miocene, when the climate was warmer and there were larger forests across most of the Northern Hemisphere. But unfortunately for them, Calicotherium showed up just after the Miocene climatic optimum, a particularly warm part of the Miocene. And after that warm period, it started to cool off. And that meant a lot of these forests started to get more and more restricted. And instead, the kind of environments that we expect today started to begin to dominate many parts of the Northern Hemisphere. And what I'm talking about there is Things like the Serengeti, or the plains in Europe, or the Great Plains in North America. Essentially, a lot of the forests that these animals would have relied on just died out because the climate wasn't right for them. And so slowly over time, as their environments that they relied on disappeared, so did things like Calicotherium. But the thing is, Calicotherium isn't some far-off, long-dead animal. It only died out 3.5 million years ago, so right around the time the first species of humans were evolving in Africa and there were even some of their relatives that made it much closer to the modern day. Nestorotherium seems to have made it to about 800,000 years ago living in Southeast Asia, 
which could potentially mean that it may have been there at the same time that some human species like Homo erectus were making it there. Additionally, there was Ankylotherium, a member of the Schizotherianae, and it lived in Africa until at least 1.8 million years ago, meaning that it almost definitely interacted with some of the first humans. In fact, some of its fossils have been found in some of the same rock formations as some of the early human fossils have been found in. So our ancestors almost definitely interacted with these animals, and it's kind of, again, wild to think about, because there's nothing like them alive today. There's nothing that's taking the same body plan of sitting on the ground and having long arms and being that big. Everything that's like them is much smaller. Even pandas aren't that huge, and even gorillas, while bigger than humans, are nothing like the sizes we see in Calicotherium. And so while it's really cool to understand this animal that would have almost definitely interacted with our ancient, ancient ancestors, it's important to remember that a lot of its relatives, while not quite as totally bizarre, are also pretty heavily endangered in most places. Many species of rhino are very heavily endangered, as are the tapir. And so while it seems like Calicotherium may be so much more interesting than any of its living relatives, it's important to take note that if things were different and we had Calicotherium and not those relatives, they would seem like the weird ones. And the thing is, when we keep that in mind, that these animals may still go extinct, and we should really try our best to make sure they don't.